We all good there? The microphone on, moving. All righty, so if you would, please, let's all stand up for the reading of the Word of God this morning. We're going to read and start off in the book of Galatians, chapter 6. We're actually going to finish the book of Galatians this morning. We've been doing a uh, verse by verse, going through the book of um, Galatians. We've been going through Paul's writings. We got through 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and um, we're coming up on the book of Galatians. I, I think I... Um, I don't know, Alana might have said, uh, I, one of my New Year's resolutions for the church was to get through Pauline epistles for the year. That's not going to happen. <laughs> it's going to take, uh, might take a, two years or something. I know the people that I studied under, it take a, like, took four years to get through, you know, for them to do their teachings and things. So, um, you know, but once again, I was telling them, we don't have a Sunday school. You know, we don't come in an hour early to where we could do a, a Sunday school teaching and then we could have a main service and then a Sunday evening service, and then a Wednesday night service, and things like that. So um, kind of pressed for time here. That's why I do try, and I appreciate, you know, anybody that's coming away 30, 40, you know, an hour away or whatever, um, I do try to give you something that, that you could chew on throughout the week and, and try to feed you with, this, with as much as I can with this small window. Uh, I know nowadays people aren't really used to long preaching and things like that, and um, they're not used to even holding a paper book in their hand anymore. they got, they got to have all these screens around them and you know they got to make it just as easy as possible on people and I just believe in just good old-fashioned having a paper Bible in your hand and flipping and turning and um, so uh, just bear with me today some of this stuff's gonna might go over your head but I do pray that you do get a blessing from it um, so let's all stand up and let's read Galatians chapter 6 Galatians chapter 6 that's page 1552 Galatians chapter 6 start off in verse number uh, Last week, I preached on, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. And then how it goes on, Paul closes this epistle, verse 12, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them, peace be on them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Unto the Galatians, written from Rome. Uh, Brother Lee, would you mind blessing the message, please? Opening up in prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May you all be seated now. So the title of the message I'm going to preach this morning is called The Three Crosses. Okay, The Three Crosses. And my emphasis that I'm going to spend most time on expounding is verse number 14 in the book of Galatians. If you would please look at verse number 14. It says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So the title of the message would be The Three Crosses. I'm going to spend a great deal of time expounding on that particular verse. But uh, let's, all, let's all back up to verse number 12. Now, if I was to ask you, most Christians are familiar with the three crosses, as in Jesus Christ you know, died for our sins, and it was two thieves next to him. Um, most Christians, they know about those three crosses, but I'm going to present a, a, another three crosses in here that most Christians have not heard before, nor do the other care, do they even really care about the other two crosses. Most Christians are concerned with, okay, the cross of Christ. But I'm going to show you this morning, you have to examine your own hearts. Um, have you ever even heard of the other two crosses and how they apply to you and things like that? So uh, let's just back up to verse number 12 here, get understanding what, what Paul's saying here in the book of Galatians. Uh, Galatians 6, 12, it says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh... 
they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So right away you see the first cross obviously is the cross of Christ. But now if you was, if you was with us in the book of Galatians, we know that Paul is addressing a certain group of people that are teaching false doctrine. And when Paul says here, he says, many desire to make a fair show in the flesh. What they're saying is this would be like your, your standard cults that tell you you have to do certain things in order to get saved, okay? They want to make a fair show in the flesh. It's all about fleshiness and things. Like, you know, hey, look at me. You know, I, I keep the law. Or, hey, look at me. You know, I come to church every single... Or, hey, look at me. I keep the sacraments. Hey, look at me. I, I, you know, I tithe. Hey, look at me. I go out and I do charity work and I do this and I do that. It's all about themselves, okay? And uh, the sure way to spot a cult, a sure way to spot a false religion is... You know, that, that leader, that person will tell you, look, you got to do certain things in order to get saved, okay? And if you, if you accepted the gospel of the grace of God, which is Jesus Christ died for you, okay? He died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day. That's salvation, okay? And I always try to, to distinguish the difference between salvation and religion. Most people in America, they got religion. And I'll tell you, if that's all you got, if all you have is religion outside of Jesus Christ, you're still going to go to hell. And that's an offensive message. That's an offensive message because if you look at the, verse, the rest of that verse, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So, you know, this whole thing, and I, I like that word only lest, uh, lest, that's avoid the risk of. So people rather go around with this, you know, humanistic mindset of religion. We got to help out our fellow man. We got to do this. We got to make the world a better place and all that. You can do all that. You could have as much money. You could, you know, like... The, old, the verse says, what's it, if profit of a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You can have all kinds of materialistic wealth and do all kinds of things for your fellow man and try to make the world a better place and all that. And yet if you, and, and let, and yet if you fall short of receiving the gospel of the grace of God, you're still going to go to hell. And that's the sure sign how you can spot all kinds of self-righteous people. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired because people always say, well, you know, you people to go to church, you think you're so righteous. You think you're, you know, it's all about you. and think, No, it's not. We're a bunch of wounded Christians. You know, we, got, we bear wounds. We go through trials and tribulations. We come in here to seek counsel from God's word. And we worship the one that is perfect. The one that, that, that he belongs. All the righteousness that I got was imparted to me because of Jesus Christ. I got no righteousness of my own. Okay. Uh, you know, that's the whole thing. You have to receive the gift of God. How many of us ever worked for a free gift before? You don't work for a free gift. You receive it by faith. Somebody stretched, God stretched forth his arm and said, you have to receive what I did for you by faith. I died for you. I was buried. I rose again the third day. You got to receive my payment. That's the payment. That's salvation. And these people in the book of Galatians, they're trying to make a fair show in the flesh. It's all fleshy. You know, that's the whole thing. People can make a fair show in the flesh. They could have everything all fixed up on the outside and glitzed up and glamored up. And, you know, oh, look at me. I do this. I do that. You know, I'm religious. I'm spiritual. And yet they could be lost because they truly never trusted in Christ alone, okay, you have to be standing on the gospel. And, um, and, and in the book of Galatians, he's battling these, these Jewish people that are telling these Christians, hey, look, you got to get back under the law. How many of us have ever heard of the law, okay? Most people heard of the Ten Commandments, right? You guys got to help me out a little bit. You guys got to say amen or yeah or something. I've been listening to far too much preaching to where there's people screaming and yelling. I need just a little bit of head nod or something to tell you guys are with me. How many, so how many of us heard of the law before? Okay, the law of Moses was given to Moses, the Ten Commandments, the dietary laws and things like that. So these Jews were trying to get Christians back under that in order to save them. Just for instance, let's just, let's, let me look, show you something in the book of Acts, okay? We're going to do a lot of kind of, you know, flipping and turning and things. Uh, that's how you learn the Bible. Uh, people are so lazy these days they can't even, you know, turn a page, but they could sit down there on a the TV and click buttons on a remote and things like that. Let's, let's turn some pages. Let's look at Acts chapter 15. That's page 1457, if you have a Bible in the pew. Uh, page 1457. I just want to show you one of the main reasons why Paul wrote the book of Galatians. He wrote it to address certain heresies. And this is the whole big thing why I put emphasis on absolute truth and things, is us Christians, we ought to know the difference between what's truth and what's error, right? That's important. You teach your kids that and things like that, what's right, what's wrong and stuff. We have to have that same approach when it comes to being a Christian. What is true versus what's an error? Most Christians nowadays, they don't know what's going on. They're so asleep. They're so lackadaisical when it comes to their, their study, their prayer life. They don't take nothing serious no more. So you better know what's true and what's error. you got to search the scriptures, okay? Acts chapter 15, here's a, here's a big reason why the book of Galatians was written. 
Acts 15, verse number 1, certain men came down from Judea. They taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now, that's pretty insane. We know what circumcision is. You snip the child when he's whatever age, you know, comes out the womb or whatever. You imagine going around trying to preach that message today. Look, guys, you can't go to heaven unless you've been circumcised. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's a pretty awkward, weird message, though, ain't it? Okay, that's, that's not taught. That's not how we're saved. This is false teachers coming into the church saying, look, you've got to get circumcised after the manner of Moses uh, or else you cannot be saved. Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, this was a big deal here. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So they go up to the, the apostles and say, okay, how are we saved? This group of people is telling us, look, we've got to be circumcised. We've got to keep the law of Moses and things. And uh, what's, what do you think about this, this, uh, this message here or what they're teaching? Look at verse 3. Being brought on their own way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Now look at verse 5. But there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees, which believed. So these Pharisees did believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Okay, they understood that. They understood, yeah, he was the suffering servant. He came down and shed his blood. But look what also what they were saying. Saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. And in verse 6, the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And if you come across the verse number uh, 9, here's the conclusion of this council. Look at verse 9. It put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples Okay, no, a yoke, that's control. That's to get them back under bondage, okay? Why put a yoke? You know, you two yoke of oxen, they're all chained up with the wooden thing and they're plowing their fields and stuff. Why are you going to try to get us back under the yoke which neither, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Yet the fathers never kept it, nor we could even ever keep the law of Moses, okay? And then look at verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. That's the message of the gospel of the grace of God, okay? The grace of God is what God did for you. Not give, dishing out all these ordinances and all these religious rituals and things. And Okay, what can you do for God? If, if you're counting on religious rituals, that ain't it. That's not the way to heaven. You have to be trusting in what God did for you, okay? Now, uh, come, back to, come back to Galatians because these people are constraining them to be circumcised, okay? And, you know, they're putting so much pressure on these early Christians you know, because what a drastic change in message it is from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That Old Testament, they were like, look, you got to bring animals, bloodshed. You got to go to the tabernacle. You got to go to the high priest and things like that. And um, you got you got to do keep all these dietary laws. You imagine, matter of fact, I, you can't even wear mixed fabrics. You imagine that if I was sitting up here preaching, you guys are going to hell because you're wearing two different kind of fabrics. <laughs> That'd be crazy. You know, you guys are going to hell because you're eating bacon and pork and eating kinds of foods and things like that. That's not the message under today's dispensation. We're on the, we're on the other side of the cross here, okay? You've got to keep reading the Bible. And uh, look at Galatians chapter 6, back to Galatians. I'd put a bookmark in here. This is the main passage that we'll be looking at this morning. But uh, we, we do got to do a lot of flipping and turning to understand some things. Um, so back to Galatians chapter 5, verse number 12. They desire to make a fair show in the flesh, and that, that word, they constrain you to be circumcised. Now, that word constrain, in a general sense, it means to press, to urge, to drive, to exert force, physical or moral, either in urging to action or in restraining it, to compel or force. So these people, they're forcing the Christian converts, you've got to get circumcised or else you cannot be saved. And Paul, throughout the whole book of Galatians, is saying that is not the way. That is not the way of salvation. You've got to watch out for these false teachers teaching other ways to get to heaven. You know? And Paul says that he makes it clear as day in Galatians chapter 1. If you're preaching any other gospel today, you are under a curse. He makes it clear out in Galatians chapter 1. So look at, just look at, for instance here, look at Galatians chapter 2. 
flip a page over a couple pages to the left, um, they were trying to get Titus look at, uh, to get circumcised. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse uh, 3 and 4. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul's saying, he says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. They're compelling him. They're constrained. You've got to get circumcised. Look what he says here. In that, because of false brethren. They're saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you still got to do these certain things in order to be saved and stuff. Because false brethren, unawares, brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Because they want to the, get them back under, under the law again. And come down to, um, uh, look at, flip a page over, flip a page over to verse number, chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, just a, couple, just a brief synopsis real quick about the book of Galatians and what Paul's dealing with. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. He says, No man, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. You know why no man's justified by the law, no matter how good you do? Because you still sin. The Bible says, For all have sinned. And people try to come into that passage and try to exclude themselves from it. Like, oh, I'm, I'm a decent person. and You sinned. Everybody broke the law. It says it's evident. Uh, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. So you say, what's the purpose of the law? Come across in the same chapter to verse 24. Look at verse 24. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith because Jesus Christ kept the law. He knew None of us could ever keep the law. So in order to get to heaven and have fellowship with them for eternity, I got to come down and keep the law for them. That's called a substitute, okay? He paid it all while you were guilty. And he, he, he paid your ticket in a sense, okay, to, to get you up there. Look at verse number 26. For ye are all children of God. It don't stop there. You are, you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You have to have faith in what the Lord has done for you, okay? So you come back to uh, flip a page over to Galatians chapter 6. Okay, Galatians chapter 6. Now it's interesting how it says in verse 12, Galatians 6, 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest, and that's interesting, that means they avoid the risk of, they're trying to avoid this. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So if you're obviously preaching salvation by grace through faith you will get persecution because that's looking men straight in the eye and telling them it don't matter how good you think you are or what you're doing you could still go to hell apart from what jesus christ did for you and that that people that rubs people the wrong way they're saying well what do you mean you know i i pray three times a day i go i fast four times a day and i make you know pilgrimages and trips to mecca and i face a certain direction when i pray and i lay out my rug and i do all these rituals and things like that Look, if you, don't have, if you don't accept what Jesus Christ did for you, that's not good enough. You have to go through Jesus Christ, okay? You've got to get salvation first before you end up getting, you're trying to do religion and trying to please God. The only way to please God, number one, is you have to accept what he did for you. That's what you're trusting on. You're trusting on God, not on ourselves, okay? That's the gospel of, uh, that's the, gospel of the grace of God. Now, uh, look, at, uh, look at the next verse here. Look at verse number... Um, 13, this is pretty clear. Galatians 13, it says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. Bunch of hypocrites. Imagine me trying to stand up here and tell you, look, you guys got to keep this, you guys got to do this, you guys got to do this, do this, do that, and then you're going to get saved. And meanwhile, I'm breaking the whole law myself. That's hypocrites. And then people teaching that in the book of Galatians and still teaching that to this day would be your Seventh-day Adventists and things like that, telling you you got you to eat certain foods still. They're hypocrites. They probably go back home and, and completely renounce what, what they're trying to tell uh, what they're trying to tell people to get saved. Look at verse 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. It's all outward stuff. You know, look, oh, he wears a certain robe to service, and look how holy and sanctified he is. And, you know, he says, call me this and call me that, and he... You know, everything looks fine on the outside, but inwardly, you know, they're a bunch of hypocrites. They don't even believe what they're preaching at the end of the day. 
And um, look at John 7, verse 9. Look what Jesus said about it. Look at John 7. I'll give you a page number on that. That's page 1396. Paul said, look, them people trying to tell you you got to get saved by the law, they don't even keep the law themselves, okay? You know who said the same thing? Jesus Christ said the same thing to the Pharisees. And like I say, that always rubs self-righteous people the wrong way, you know? And that's the first step when it comes to salvation is you got to humble yourself. you gotta, you got to knock that pride out of you and say, I'm not good enough to make it to heaven. God, I need what you did for me. I can't work my way up there, you know, and I can't ever keep this law. It's impossible. So thank God for his, for his grace and mercy he came down to save us. Look at, look at John chapter 7, page 1397. Um, John chapter 7, look at verse 19. This is the Lord speaking to these uh, Pharisees and stuff. He's up in the temple teaching these Jews and stuff. He's trying to correct them on doctrine. Um, look at verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? And look what he says. And yet none of you keepeth the law? <laughs> Bunch of hypocrites. None of you even keep the law. Moses gave it to you. You guys ain't even keeping it. Why go ye about to kill me? <laughs> Why you go about to kill me? They were so jealous and envious that Jesus Christ, man, he kept the law. He was the only one to ever walk a perfect life, perfectly sinless. And that's what it takes to, you know, that, that, that's what, it, you know, that's, you see all these, uh, um, these animal sacrifices. What would be the purpose of back in the Old Testament? How they were killing this innocent animal, and somehow that innocent animal would, would atone for their sins that they're doing. You needed something innocent. You got them wicked devil people. You say, this is all crazy stuff. No, them wicked devil people, they're sacrificing babies. They were doing that in the Old Testament. They were killing babies on, on behalf of their sins because they thought that it would appease their God from having innocent blood. So that's why we accept what Jesus Christ did for us in his blood. Okay, He's the innocent lamb that died for us so that we don't got to go out and do those things and, and kill animals and, uh, and try to work our way to heaven and stuff. And, that's, and he makes it evident, they didn't, you guys didn't keep the law. He's talking to the Pharisees. And then Paul says in, in Galatians 6, Neither they themselves, who are circumcised, keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory uh, in their flesh. Okay? Like all the emphasis gets put back on mankind. Look how good we're, we are. Look how good we are. That's not the case. All, any glorying that I have comes from Jesus Christ and what he imparted unto me and what he did for me. Okay? The glorying is not on men's behalf at all. Come across back to Ver, uh, Galatians chapter 6. Um, now here, here are the three crosses. I'm going to really spend a little time on, on this, uh, on verse number 14. This is where things get a little more practical, okay? You know, that right there, a couple of verses right there, that was a little bit of doctrinal teachings. That was, look, you're not saved by circumcision. You're not saved by keeping the law. You are saved by trusting in what Jesus Christ did for you, his death, burial, and resurrection, okay? Now, look at verse number 14. The title of the message would be the three crosses, and here's the three crosses in one verse, okay? Like I said, most of you people, are probably, most Christians, you guys have been Christians for a while or whatever, most people never heard of these other two crosses, okay? Look at, uh, look at um, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory... God forbid that any of us should glory. Really think about that. We got no glorying within ourselves, no matter how good we think we are and stuff like that. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we want to glory, we've got to glory on what God did for us, on the cross. That would be cross number one. The cross number one would be the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us would be familiar with that. That is what saved us. Um, it saved, it, that's what saves our soul. And it sanctifies us in heaven and in earth. It sets us apart. The cross, we're different than anybody else in the world because of that reason right there. We are sanctified. We're separated. We're saved by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now look at the next cross here. I don't want to spend too much time on the first cross. We, we should know about the first cross. But look at the second one. By whom the world is crucified unto me. The second one would be the world's cross. The world's cross. And, and you know what that says? You know what Paul says? The world is crucified unto me. Is the world crucified unto you? That's to tell you that the world is supposed to be dead to you. It's crucified. You, somebody gets crucified, they die. Now I want to look at some verses on uh, the world is crucified to the believer. Okay? 
The world is crucified for the, to the believer. The world is dead to them. And this is, once again, this, this, this isn't a popular thing. Uh, people nowadays, they're so carnally minded. You know what that means? They're just so considered with planet Earth, planet Earth. They're just so down here. They never think about eternity. They, they're just all focused on this, this world. Imagine that this world's supposed to be dead to us, okay? Look at John chapter, um, look at John chapter seven, 17, John 17, verse 9. I'm going to show you what the Lord Jesus Christ said here. Look at John 17, page 14, 16. The second cross I'm going to talk about is the world's cross. Okay, so if you, get, if, you, if you leave here this morning, what I want you to understand is I want you to understand the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand the world's cross and how that the world is supposed to be dead to a Christian. All right, you, you, now, and you know, think about this. You want to practically apply this to yourselves. When I first got saved, the things of the world, they just grew awfully dim to me. You know, things that, that, that I once enjoyed, that I once partook in and stuff like that, number one is wrecking havoc, you know, on a health standard. You know, you're going out drinking and smoking weed and smoking pot and going out and doing all kinds of filthy things. That's not good, okay? It, it's, it, it's, uh, it'll wreck your health. It'll obviously, uh, it'll send you to hell, those things. Uh, those things aren't, aren't good. And, you, and, and it's interesting, you know, you, people have fun in those things. And they laugh and smile and you're, you're killing yourself. You know, you, especially getting drunk at things. You, you fall on, you look at these college parties and stuff like that. These people are, are half dead. People die from that, all that peer pressure and things like that. Then they wake up and then they go back and do it the next day and say, man, I'm having a good old time. You're sick and stupid in the head. There's something wrong with you. If you really think about it, that's a good time. People are so twisted. Their mindset of what's good does not line up with the Bible. That's how sick America is and people in general. You know, in America, they're just so focused on these, these things that try to please their flesh and things that the world offers them. People would rather seek the world for counsel and help and, than seeking God, your creator. <laughs> you look around and say, how, how did all this stuff get here? God put it here. And that'd be foolish to me if I'd come into this building and say, yeah, you know, cool building, too bad nobody built it. You think about that. Too bad nobody built this building. Somebody built the building. You look, you look at planet Earth, you look at these beautiful colors we're driving down the road. You know, there ain't no greater artist than God, how he just fades the colors like that on the skies. You got the blue, you got the, the light, then it goes like yellow, and it goes down to pink and things. That's a beautiful thing. You could look, you, you, can you look at that and say, oh, too bad nobody created it? Dumb. Where, where, where's everybody's head at? God, the, the architect of the world, created all this stuff. There's no greater joy and purpose in life is to serve your creator and your savior. That's where the true joy is, true pleasure. You know, people try to find it in, in drugs and it kills themselves. It warps their mind and all that filthy stuff, cursing and swearing and watching wrong things on TV. The, that, the world is supposed to be dead to us. That's what the Bible says. The world, Paul said the world is crucified unto me. Now, could you say that? Could you, uh, sitting here right now, could you say that about yourself and your walk with God? Can you say that the world is crucified to me? After I got saved, these things that I was doing in the world, they're not really pleasing to me no more. I care less about them now. I want something different. I want something from God. <laughs> I don't want nothing from the world anymore. I want something from God himself. Now look what Jesus said in John 17, verse 9. He says, I pray, he says, uh, John 17, verse 9, um, I pray for them, the ones that believed on him, I pray not for the world. You're praying for the world. You're praying for world peace and all that. You're wasting your time. It's a waste of time at the end of the day. Jesus says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Okay? And um, you come across another one. The believer uh, is to be crucified, or the world is crucified to the believer. Another thing I'm going to show you about the world, okay? Look at uh, the book of 2 Peter. Look at the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, you could have all these materialistic things in the world. I'll give you a page number. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll give you a page number. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3. That's page number 1632. And you look at all these things. You know, the Bible says they heaped up treasure in the last days and stuff like that. You know, people got all these materialistic goods. And, you know, they're, they're saving for retirement and, and investing and all these things. They're just stuck down here like, like that's it. You know, like that's all there is, just planet Earth. There's a piece of you that goes on for eternity. That's your soul. You came from God. He's eternal. 
He, bre he breathed in you, became a soul, uh, a, a spirit. You became a living soul. You have a soul inside of you. And now that soul is going to reside somewhere. That thing don't die. That thing don't fade away. It's not material. It's something spiritual. That thing goes on for eternity and resides in either heaven or hell. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Here's a, a thing why we shouldn't really get too caught up in the world and things. Because the world lies under the wrath of God. One day this world's going to collapse in a big bang. Okay, I think scientists got it a little backwards. They say it started with a big bang. I believe it ends with a big bang. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 6. 2 Peter 3 6. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, the heavens and earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The world lies under the wrath of God. We should have no business with it. Now come over to James. You know, you shouldn't really care too much about the world. And I know the old saying, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. How many of us ever heard of that? You know, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Now, that, that's true. You know, that, that's, a, that's a general good statement there. That we are in the world. We've got to do things. We've got to go to work. We've got to pay our bills, okay? You don't just expect, you know, let the government take care of you and things like that. You've got you to gotta work. You've got to live an honest, decent life while you're down here. But I know at the end of the day that this earth isn't my permanent dwelling place. I know that this earth, like that old song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. You know, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Look at James chapter 4. Another thing about the world's cross, the world is to be crucified to the Christian. The world's supposed to be dead to us. And I'm, and, and I'm going to tell you another point. The world is just like death. It's an enemy to us. The world is the enemy of a Christian. Okay, so when you get saved, you always you got to get this down with Christians when they first get saved. It ain't just a bed of roses. It ain't lovey-dovey and kissy-kissy. Things are just perfect the rest of the time. No way. you got to deal with enemies every single day. And there's the top three enemies of a Christian. The first enemy you got to deal with every single day is you look at them in the mirror. You say, well, you know, what's this, what's this, you know, what's my flesh up to today? What are you going to try to do to, to get me to sin, to get me to stumble and things like that? you got to deal with yourself every day. Then you got to deal with the world, okay, what the world's throwing at you, all the pressure that the world puts on you through science and philosophy and politics and social media. That's a big one. Now, nowadays, with the younger generations, you know, even older generations, they spend all the time on Facebook. Facebook, I, I, I call that nose book. You're just poking around and poking your nose in everybody's business and look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing, look what she's doing, what she's doing, I'm eating this, I'm doing that. Social media, man, and then it gets you to compare yourself amongst other people and things like that. That, that gets to the depression. Especially with young people. I don't know, maybe older people, they're, they're comfortable, they're happy, okay. When it comes to younger people, that takes a toll on them. You know, you, you even hear that in school. People start comparing them all, you know, all these women and things. Next thing you know, they're choking themselves in the bathroom. They're throwing up and things because they don't look, they don't fit a certain physique or something that what the world propagates to them and stuff like that. And that that's, that's all of the world. And that, the world is supposed to be an enemy to us. That's supposed to be dead to us. Okay, so you look at James chapter 4. Look what it says in James 4. It's clear as can be. Look at James chapter 4, verse 4. That's page 1621. James 4, 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Enmity, that means there's a division there. Okay? Friendship of the world is enmity with God. If we're supposed to be saved Christians, saved from the world, why in the world do we want to continue to be friends with the world? Why are we going to try to say, you know, compromise our standards and compromise mainly what the Bible says? You know, yeah, and look what he says. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Is that pretty clear? That's pretty clear. People say, oh, the Bible is so hard to understand and stuff. Look at it. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's elementary style language right there. And that's the whole thing. We can't be too yoked up, too friends, you know, in agreement with the world because the world's contrary to us and things. Here, here's Romans chapter, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, page 1503. Romans chapter 12. We are not to conform to the standards of the world. Okay? And, and, and look what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We are to be different. We are to stick out in the sense of promoting what is right, 
you know, what is promoting righteousness and how to live a good, clean, holy life and things like that. The world's going to look at you like you're some type of crazy nut because you don't want to go out there and get drunk and kill your brain cells. You don't want to go out there and fornicate and sleep with every person around the block and things. You don't want to go out there and sell drugs, try to make easy money and things like that. What, you know, what are you, stupid? You're foolish? They're the ones that are twisted and warped. You always got to think of that. All this peer pressure and propaganda, that's of the world. And, and for, for a practical application to us Christians, look at chapter 12, Romans 12. Look at verse number 1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. I like that word beseech because that's earnest. He earnestly wants you to do this right here. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. How are we, how are we to present ourselves? Holy, acceptable unto God. Forget about what the fellow men think. Does it say acceptable unto men? No, it says acceptable unto God. We want to please God. Despite of, we ain't supposed to be a bunch of men pleasers and things like that. We ought to be God pleasers. Okay? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I think that's reasonable as can be. Christ came down did all this for me to save my soul. The least I can do is give up some things that, that my flesh wanted to present my body a living sacrifice and things like that. A living sacrifice. You know what that implies? That means you've got to kill certain desires that you have in your heart for the sake of, I'm going to do what's pleasing to God. You know, people got all kinds of corrupt and sinful desires. You want to serve God. Now, I'll, I'll show you a verse in Galatians actually on that. But look at verse 2. You say, well, how do I do this then? How, how, do I, how do I present myself holy and acceptable? One of the first steps is number, verse number two. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. All starts first off with the mind. In the mind, the, the devil's trying to capture your minds. You know, the old, the old saying too, garbage in, you know, garbage out. You're sitting around filling your mind with TV and social media and movies and Hollywood movies and all that stuff. It's garbage in. That's, it's going to portray in your outward life. It all starts with the mind. That's where the battleground starts. You've got to transform by the renewing of your mind. How, how in the world are you supposed to renew your mind then? You've got to read the Bible. There's no way in the world to have fellowship with God outside of his word. You have to commune with him. God's talking right to you. And that's the whole reason why people don't want to read this Bible. Because it tells them, oh, man, man you know, you know they, they don't, they, they'd rather just claim ignorance or put it on the shelf rather than, man, God's telling me to do this and I'm comfortable in my sin. I don't want to give this up and things like that. When God, he, he constantly is pushing us to, you know, no, keep, stand your ground, keep your standards high. You know, I'm telling you to, to do things, do your best to live in obedience to me. So there's the reason why people don't want to read their Bible because they want to hang on to their lusts. They want to hang on to their, their greediness and their desires and their materials and things like that. You know, so you got to think about that. And look what verse, uh, the rest of that verse says. By the renewing of your mind, you Christians, we got to renew our minds, okay? Then it says that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perf in the perfect will of God. The, you know, people say, what's the will of God in my life? Read the Bible. You'll find out what the will of God is in your life that you may be wholly acceptable, trying to live right, trying to obey what God is telling us to do in the meantime, okay, on our, on our daily walk with him and things. All right, look at Titus chapter 2. Remember, the world is supposed to be dead to us. Look at Titus chapter 2. Look at Titus chapter 2. Look at Titus. Titus chapter 2. Look at verse number 11. So there's something that, that happens, all right? You've received the gospel of the grace of God. You realize, man, Lord, you know, you've done all this for me. I was just a wicked, vow, you know, no good sinner, and I received what you did for me. You know, man, that's a special thing, the love of God. We talked about that last week, how it's a loving letter. And you cannot comprehend the, the love of, that, that God has for a born-again child of God. And uh, look, look at, look at uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Here's some good practical things here. Look at 11. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now there's a comma there. So that continues the thought. Okay, it's a continuation. What does the grace of God actually do aside from save us? 
The grace of God teaches us things. Look what it teaches us. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. We've got to deny all the ungodliness. We've got to take a stand against the ungodliness, not compromise and tolerate, oh, it's okay, it's fine, you know. Who are we to judge and things? I, I'm so sick and tired of that one too. Oh, you're judging people, you're judging. We're not supposed to judge. You've got to judge all things by God's book, okay? If I was to judge things by my own standards and my own opinions, forget about that. I, my, my judgment would be skewed. It would be messed up. It would be biased and things like that. We've got to judge things to God's standards. That's the only way to judge, okay? So that, and you, have, you judge things on it. Those people that say that, they're the most judgmental people of all, when you really think about that. You judge things every single day. You make de decisions on what's, what's right, what's wrong. A person that doesn't judge nothing, there's something wrong with their head because they're, 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 you have to judge the difference. You have to discern to be able to tell what's this, what's that, what's true, what's false. So there's constant judgment all day. Now we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Now, look, now here, here's the prescription. Are we going to take it or are we going to leave it? Most people are going to walk out here and leave it. They're going to say, I don't, I don't want to get fixed. I don't want help from God. I'm going to do things my way. That's pride. Pride comes destruction, okay? You got to remember that, too. You start getting all puffed up, you're going you're gonna to fall hard. That's what the Bible says, too. Now, look at this. We should live soberly, okay? So the opposite of, of worldly lust is to be intoxicated, all right? And that's a, that's a big verse right there, that we should live. Now, now, notice that. He's talking to Christians. You know, born again, saved children of God, we should live soberly, okay? Now, you got to ask yourself, how, you know, how, how you been doing with that? You know, are you just want to do things with what you do? Or you want, are you going to try to yield to God so that God can help you and fix up this trouble? So people out there, you got to, you know, use that. You're around worldly Christians or whatever. Look, the Bible says we should live soberly. I don't want to drink. I'm all right. And they're thinking, oh, just a little bit. No, I'm good. The Bible says I live soberly. I don't, I don't want to trust it. I know I can't handle that. I might take one sip. Next thing you know, I end up might liking it. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm down on the wrong path again. I'm out of the will of God, okay? The Bible says we should live soberly. That's all. They should understand that. And then the next part is righteously. Okay, you got to think about that. Are we, are we trying to do what we can do to live righteously? Trying to do what's right and stand up for what's right. Okay? And godly in this present world. Um, are, we, are we trying to conform ourselves to God's standards? Not our own standards because, I'm, you know, we're, we tend to be lazy and compromise and things. We have to comply ourselves to God's standards. And, and that's, that's something that, that we should constantly work at as a Christian. It's going to be hard. You know, it's gonna, any, any warfare is hard. You know, the, that's the Christian life. It's likened unto a spiritual battle. It's likened unto warfare. It ain't ever going to be easy. But through the help and the grace of God, he'll get you through it, though. Look at, our first, look at 1 John. Look at 1 John 2.15 about the world's cross. All right? The world is supposed to be dead to us. Look at um, 1 John. I'll give you a page number on that. 1 John. See if I can find it here. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. That's page number 1634. I want everybody to read this one. This is another big passage because the Bible, you know, Paul said in Galatians, the world is crucified unto me. The world's supposed to be dead to us. And here, here's just other verses that, that, that coincide with that thought. Look at verse, uh, look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says, love not the world. Okay, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because listen, at the end of the day, we're not, regardless of how good things are, you know, you may have got a you know, good marriage, good house, good job. Everything seems to be smooth sailing. If you're a Christian, at the end of the day, there'd be nothing better than to, than to drop dead and be home with your father at home in heaven. You know, and, and like I, I, I agree with this too, you know, if you, if you want anything else, you know, and there's all kinds of jokes and things like that about young women wanting to get married and stuff like that. And, you know, the, usually the young ladies say, well, Lord, can't you just wait until I get married, until you come back and things like that? Because they want to get married. They want to have a life. They want to have kids. Look, the, your main desire, your main desire in life is to want to be home with your father in heaven. You know, and, that's, and I'll show you. If you don't want to be with your father in heaven, well, you have to say, did I ever receive the grace of God? Did I ever even get saved? 
I, the Bible says I got the Holy Spirit inside of me. There's a piece of me that desires to be with my Father in heaven. There's something, there's a drastic change. It's the new birth. You know, that whole thing can't ever be explained or, or figured out intellectually. That's what God does. And it says if you love, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He sums up, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of, your, of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You do things that are pleasing to God, you go up to the judgment seat of Christ, those are your treasures that you're bringing up. You know, people ask, well, how much did this rich man leave behind and stuff? He left behind all of it. <laughs> You can't, you know, you don't see a you know, U-Haul truck driving to the, to the graveyard and things. You leave every single thing down here on planet Earth, okay? You, you can't get around that. But if you're trying to live for God and do service for God, you get caught up at, after the rapture at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord judges us, okay? You know, uh, good, you accepted what I did for you. Now, what have you done for me this whole time, you know? And most Christians, they just done nothing for, for God. They just lived after themselves the whole time. They never sacrificed themselves. They never put down the desires and lusts that their flesh wanted. They continued to partake in it. That's not good. We want to we love, the, in our love of God, that's what motivates us to clean things up in our life. But, you know, anybody, anybody wants to please their, their father. You know, if you're a good, honest, well-rounded person, you want to do what's right. You know, you, wanna, you don't want to cause your father grief and strife and things like that. God forbid, I only know how much grief and strife I caused my dad before I was saved and things. Now, my mindset's changed. You know, I, I'm the same thing when it comes to God is I want to try to live for God, you know, so he's happy with me. So before when I stand at the, jud at the judgment seat, he could look at me and say, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And there'd be nothing better than getting a pat on the back from God. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord, my son, you know. That'd be a blessing. That's, you know, because we, we won't do it because we love God. That's one of the first commandments even. Love the Lord thy God with all of our hearts, soul, and, and mind and things. And, uh, and that's part of my job, and I believe that. Part of my job as a preacher is not to make you comfortable in this world. It's to make you homesick for heaven. Amen. Not to get you all comfortable and, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to teach you what to do with your money and finances and all that stuff and try to get you all zoned in down here on planet Earth. I want to get you stirred up to where I want to be with my Father. And, I wanna, you, and I'm trying to motivate you and exhort you and stir you up to, to live pleasing, with, you know, uh, pleasing to God in accordance to His Word and things. Okay, so the last cross I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to be done, that was the world's cross. Remember, let's go back to Galatians and get back on our bearings here where, where that all came from. Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It'd be cross number one. That's the first cross you've got to get to. All right, you missed that cross, you missed everything. You've got to get, you've got to stop at the cross. We're going to sing that song here at the end. We're at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. We're going to sing that song. We're going to close with that song. But that's the first cross you've got to go to. And then you, go, you stop at that cross. Then look what it says, by whom the world is crucified unto me. The world is supposed to be dead to a creator. They don't, the things that you once saw that were pleasing and fun and all that stuff, nah, I don't want to partake in that no more. I'm, on a, I'm, I'm, going, I'm trying to live for God now. I've I'm, I'm, got to change a direction. Okay. Now the last cross that I want to focus on is your cross. Because look what Paul says. He says, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The world's dead to me and I'm dead to the world. <laughs> okay. Now look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Look at Luke chapter 9. The last cross that I don't know if you ever heard about before, but it's your cross. Okay, this is your personal cross. Look at Luke 9. Luke 9, 23. And people don't like to talk about this cross. You know, they don't want to, uh, because you, you look, you'll, you'll see it. Look at it. Look at Luke 9, 23. That's page uh, 1348. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse uh, 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, Jesus Christ is saying this, If any man come after me, 
I like, you know, I know this is talking about men and women and things, but I always say we need some good godly men in this world. We need some good godly men, some men that are good counsels over the wife to teach them and, 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 and help them grow and, and be connected in fellowship, you know, because the, the woman came out of the man's rib. And nowadays we can't find too many good leaders when it comes to men. That's why churches predominantly, they're filled up with a lot of women. And I do believe that we need some good godly men to, to sit down, pray with our wives, sit down and study with them, teach them the Bible and things like that. Um, I would to God, if we, at least, you know, a couple guys that we got in here, that they'd grow up to be good godly men. Now, that, now this goes for any Christian. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Can you imagine that? In a, in a selfish, egotistical, narcissistic world we live in, trying to deny ourselves and say, no, I don't want to do any more what I want to do. I'm going to do what God wants to do now, you know. It ain't about me just rolling a relationship, honey. You're listening to me. You're listening to me. It's let's do what God wants us to do. That's a, that's a blessing, and it, it's hard to do. Let, let a man deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That shows you that we got a cross of our own that we got to bear, and the Lord said that. But, but whosoever will save his life shall lose it. That's a, a paradox right there. Whosoever shall save his life, because they're just hanging on to the things of this world. That's all they do. They're just hanging on to this world, and then they die, and they lose it. They end up missing the whole boat, end up going to hell, when you think about it. And look at that. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. That's an interesting thing. That's a paradox right there. You lose your life. You deny the things that, that you know. People are uh, losing their jobs for taking stands on the vaccine and things like that. they got convictions against that, religious convictions. And they're saying, no, nah, no, nah, forget it. I'm going to stick with, with God. I believe that, you know, uh, body's temple of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to defile it and things like that. And, and they're trying to stick up for, for the Bible and try to use their religious exemption. They say, no, you're, you lose your job and things. That's, that's crazy. But there's, there's going to come suffering when it comes to denying yourself. Look what Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. The last cross is, be, is to be your personal cross. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul talks about it. Now, I think about it. Anytime you think of a cross, it has to deal with death. Self-denial. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. 1 Corinthians 15, that's page 1528. And we live in a day and age where there's no such thing as temperance. No such thing as self-control. People act on impulse. You know, and they act off their emotions and things like that. There's no, there's no temperance keeping our bodies in subjection, keeping them in control and things. They let the world work them over and get the best of them and stuff like that. Now look at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 31. That's page 1528. Look at verse 31. Look what Paul says here. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at that last part of that verse. I die daily this is a, a, a thing we got to do every single day look i know this may be pleasing in my flesh and i know the bible says sin sin is pleasurable but for a season that's the whole purpose of why people continue to sin because it's pleasurable you can't get around it everybody likes to sin everybody likes to rebel and do things it, it feels good to your flesh and stuff it's only pleasurable but for a season and then you got to reap the repercussions of it we studied that a couple weeks ago you reap what you sow and things like that he says i die daily how many of us would like to go down to the down to the cemetery and dig up a dead body and hang out with it Does anybody want to do that here you guys want to go down to the cemetery and dig up a dead body and spend time with it and hang out with it and be buddies with it and you know yoked up with it and stuff no the bible says that our, our flesh is to be dead we're like an under a, our flesh to skin we're not to serve it all the time and then you know, many people they dig up their their old man you know their old flesh is supposed to be crucified and dead with christ they dig that guy back up and want to spend time with it again. I want to keep him dead. I want to keep him down under, under the ground. I don't want to bring up my old man, what the Lord saved me from and all that, all my old past sins and stuff. I don't want to dig that guy back up and bring him back out and spend time with him. <laughs> Just like you wouldn't want to do with, with a corpse down at the cemetery down there. Think about that. Uh, Paul says, I die daily. And look, look at Galatians for, for further insight on what he's talking about here. Galatians chapter... Five. It's in the it's in it's in the book he talked about. We were studying. Look at Galatians five twenty four. Look at Galatians five twenty four. You know now we're talking about your cross. 
Okay? Uh, look at Galatians 5.24. Um, page 1552. He says, And they that are Christ's, if you belong to God, if you accepted what God did for you, his death, burial, and resurrection, you're trusting in that to get you to heaven. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That implies that the, the, the cross that we got to carry, that's self-denial. Let a man deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the spirit. All right. Now, um, I want to look at a, a couple, uh, two more passages here. We'll be through. All right. Uh, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 16. 2 Corinthians. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 16. I actually got a couple more than two. 2 Corinthians 2, 16. This is, a, this is an interesting one. You know, this is a, it's an interesting passage here. Um, but I do like what this teaches. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. And that's the whole thing is when you get saved, I can't emphasize the most of getting around a good Bible-believing crowd. You know, all right? Get around a good Bible-believing crowd. All right? and I'm going to show you this little thing. It's a little, little funny here. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse uh, um, 15. Well, verse 14, get a little context. Uh, he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. We, we, we know, we're supposed to smell good to God at the end of the day, okay? And our prayers are likened unto incense going up before heaven, all right? You walk in their house, you got a good cook in the house, you walk in, man, this stuff smells good, you know, I can't wait, and things like that. Now, unto God, we are to be a sweet Savior of Christ. In them that are saved, and in them that perish, look at that colon there as a continuation, to the one, we are a savor of death unto death. We are supposed to stink to the lost world. <laughs> we are a Savior to death unto death, and to the other saved Christians, when we get around a good bunch of saved godly Christians, good Bible-believing Christians, we have a good sweet-smelling Savior. All right. Now I'm not talking about cologne and deodorant and things like that, but uh, and, not, and, and to the opposite, the ones that aren't saved, we're supposed to rise up a good stink to them. They say, "Oh man, what a what a buzzkill! What a what a you know whatever you want to call him. He thinks he's all this, all that, and holy Joe, holy roller. This guy stinks. You're killing all the fun. But when you're around, you get around a good Bible-believing crowd, they love you. You know, they're shouting, you, "Amen!" You know, glory to God. Let's sing. Let's get into more Bible. What's the Lord been showing you in the Word? What's the Lord been showing you in the world? Or in in the Word and stuff like that. To where the opposite crowd, all they want to talk about is politics and the news and what's the latest trend out there on social media and stuff like that. That's not that's that's not what it's to be about. Um, and there's there's and what's sad to say, there's Christians out there that they love the world. They they spend way too much attention and their time in the world, and, and that's not good. Now uh, come back to um, look at First John. Here's another good one. I like this one. First John. First John chapter four. The reason why I spend so much time is, is flipping and giving scriptures because that's the word of God. All right? There's nothing better. The Bible says we've got to renew our minds. We've got to cleanse our minds. And, and that's this, the only thing in this world that will do it is this Bible. Okay? Look at, look at 1 John chapter uh, 4. That's page 1636. I'm almost, I'm almost be through here. Um. 1636, it's 1 John chapter 4, look at verse um, Look at verse 4, it's a good one. Okay, ye are of God little children and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I believe that. God, I got Jesus Christ living inside my heart. Greater is Christ than anything else is in this world. And look at verse 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. People that are of the world, that's all they care about is just worldly things. You could tell by the way that they talk. A born-again child of God, you can tell that their speech gets different. They don't start talking about the world no more. They start talking about the things of God. They start talking about the Bible and prayer and, and righteous, holy living and things like that. In the world, here at them. So I'll tell you, that, that's why it shows you your crowd that you're around all the time. If you're constantly speaking about the world, you're going to find people that, that love the world. You're going to go around those types of people. 
Then look at verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. You claim to know God, you're going you're gonna to hear us. You're going to hear people, what they got to say about the Bible and things. He that is not a God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You got to spend time in the book to know what is truth and what's error. So at the, I'm going to let's close up on Galatians. Let's close on Galatians. So there's three crosses right there in that one verse in Galatians chapter um, 14. I ain't going to spend a great deal of time expounding on these last, but I am going to close up in the book of Galatians. Galatians 14, or Galatians 6, 14, Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you don't get nothing from this message this morning, I pray that you first off understand the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. His blood shed that he shed for our sins. And he was buried and he resurrected the third day. The gospel of the grace of God. You got to get that first. Okay. Then once you get saved, you got a new birth. You got a new creature inside of you. The new man. You got two natures. You got the old man. He's supposed to be dead. You got the new man who we're supposed to live after. Christ in you. Now that's for cross number one, Lord Jesus Christ. Cross number two, by whom the world is crucified unto me. So you all got to examine your hearts here. We're supposed to be saved Christians. Is the world crucified to us? Think about that. And then the last cross would be the cross of our, our own cross. And I unto the world. The world's dead to me. I'm supposed to be dead to the world. Okay? I'm supposed to serve God now. I'm not partaking of things of the world and things. Now verse 15. Finish off these last four verses here. Paul says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, Meaning it ain't no big deal. You know, you get circumcised, okay, get circumcised. You don't get circumcised, no big deal. He says, neither nor uncircumcision, that's not what saves you, but a new creature. That's where the power is at. That's the saving power, is that new birth, that new creature. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now that's something. That's the saving power. And uh, I got, there is a verse over there in um, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Um, I'm just going to read it real quick, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Old man, that old man's passed away. You would, if you would see me three years ago, you'd be like, what in the world is that? <laughs> what in the world? What a drastic, you know, a drastic change for the glory of God. You know, and not because not of what I wanted to do. I know sin's pleasurable. But it was for the sake of God's power that I'm, I'm yielding him. Lord, use me however you see fit and things like that. We're, we're just, just allow me to just be a mouth, you know, just to, just to <laughs> proclaim what, what he did for me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So that's what Paul talks about in that verse there, but a new creature. That's what really, that's the saving power there, not circumcision and uncircumcision. And then verse 16, he says, as many as walk according to this rule, you know, preaching the right gospel, preaching the new, the new birth, the new creature. Peace be on them in mercy and upon the God and upon the Israel of God. I ain't getting on a big doctrinal thing on that, but the Israel of God is obviously the saved Jews that got a hold of the message of the gospel, the grace of God. Okay, and they were traditionally Jews trying to follow their Jewish law and ordinances and dietary laws, um, uh, but they got a hold of the gospel of the grace of God. So that's why he says, upon the Israel of God, the true saved Jews, in that sense. Then I like verse 17, how Paul uh, ends this thing up. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. You know, just don't, don't bug me with all these doctrinal issues, in, in a sense. I, I spent this whole book, if you still believe you're saved by the law, then you're not reading. Okay, he says it over and over again, you're not saved by the law, you're saved by faith in Christ. Henceforth, let no man trouble me. And I like this, this is big. For I bear... In my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul was whipped. He was shipwrecked for this. He was beaten. He was thrown in jail for preaching the message on what God did for them. You imagine that. Going around preaching, Jesus Christ loved you enough to come down and die for you. And they're beating him. They're killing him. They're throwing stones at him and things like that for that message. He says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered persecution. Remember that verse started off in verse 12? Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. 
Paul suffered persecution for the cross of Christ because he stood by the cross. He didn't keep up with all those religious, what they were trying to teach him, and you got to do this to get saved and do that. He said, uh-uh, it's only by the cross of Christ. And he got persecuted for that. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. I bear my uh, body in the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he closes this, this message off with one of Paul's uh, standard closings by grace. All right, Paul's standard closings is, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Remember God's grace, the saving power on what he did for you. And he says, Amen. So that closes up the book of Galatians. And uh, I just want you to really think about on that verse there that we spent some time on. Um, have you been to the first cross, number one? Um, are you saved? You know, when did you get saved? When did you experience the, the new birth, in a sense, where you, you kneeled down, whether, where it was at church or whether it was on the bed or whether it was driving down the road? Ask yourself this question while you're sitting in that pew. When did you get saved? When did you put your faith on what Christ did for you? That's the first cross. And then you've got to ask yourself, is the world crucified? To you or do you still enjoy you know everybody's going to sin you know and and, and and continue to fall but you're i don't understand how people could still have fun in their sin they just enjoy it they just have fun in it and they're laughing having a good old time and stuff that that sin should depress you at the end of the day and should let you down because we got it in and, and that's part of it that's the that's the emphasis or who you're surrounding yourself with and what are you watching on tv and things like that and then the, the, the last cross is our, is our own cross, our self-denial for the sake of Christ. So um, I just want you, to, want you to think about that this morning. Um, John Paul, would you close us off in prayer this morning? Lord, we pray for your blessings over this message. We thank you for your preacher who was able to deliver this message. We pray that the uh, quality of Christ is edified, Lord, and that you, know, you would exhort them to go out and serve you and to love you and realize that Amen. Amen. So let's all sing, um, I think it's page number 129. Page number 129. Page 129, At the Cross. Shut
what his glory is in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith, amen, I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Verse 4, what drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe? Dear Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. Singing that makes me happy. Amen. I don't want anybody to forget what we talked about today. Really try to apply those last two crosses. If you've been to the first cross, apply those last two crosses to your life and walk with God. Amen. Sometimes we walk out of here, you know, we get too carried away with, with the fellowship. I really want that to be impressed on your hearts about those last two crosses. Really think about those two. Um, thanks for hanging out.